Tonight is it's the 14th of April 2016 and uh, we're in the home of Liam and Eleanor McHugh here in Drumna Bay Road, Spamming. And uh, Liam's a well-known personality in the area, in the wider area, and uh, we'll just do sort of a talk on Liam's life and uh, sort of the origins, where his father and his mother came from. So Liam, your father was who? Uh, Jared, my father was uh, Josie McHugh, right. and uh, a lot of people would know my father. We called him Josie McHugh, the betterware man. Mm -hmm. And he spent, I think it was 35 odd years on the betterware. Mm -hmm. He was the manager of uh, the throne branch of uh, betterware. Yeah. My father went on as well after that when he finished on the betterware, he was we Josie the milkman. Right. So he worked for Bear Tui here for maybe 15 or 20 years. And uh, Anyway, my mother, she was uh, Hamilton, right. and uh, my grandfather, her her uh, father was Wally Hamilton, mm -hmm. and I think we were from the gas in there, in, in Castle Dare. Right. And uh, my mother's mother was Doherty, uh, from Dunny Loop. So uh, that's roughly... You mentioned the gas lane, whereabouts to them is not... Sure of it. Where was the gas lane? The gas lane, in other words, is known as Meeting House Lane. Right. So that's down in there now, in there, the wee entry, uh, in there, across the road from Vivo. Vivo. In there, that wee entry, and there was, we were all brought up there. Well, apart from me, I was born. We moved from Meeting House Lane, uh, but there was the likes of Hilary McHugh's family, and uh, there was Brenton Conley. Uh, his family, John, and all them ran about with him, but uh, I think maybe the Coils and uh, all the McHughes and maybe Lynch's and all that crowd. But hmm. I moved to, or we moved to Brook Park, and uh, I was born uh, a couple of months after we moved up to Brook Park, so that was 1961. Right. So I was born and reared up there. Were they new houses at the time? Or? They were brand new houses, I 22 houses in Brook Park. That's right. So the likes of... Uh, my childhood uh, were growing up in them days was uh, Castle Fun Park, Churchtown Park, Hillview Park, all them parks, Harper Park was all fields. Yes. And we just, our childhood was growing up all around them fields, like Easter huts and playing football in the fields and stuff. And then growing up all of a sudden, then these, these parks all just came up around us, you know. Mm. Well, and, so, and, and, and Brook Park, who would have been the sort of the young lads you've been running about? Well, well, I suppose uh, still friends today, you know, uh, good friends was two doors away from me, was Marty Lafferty, mm -hmm. uh, Tar Lynch, John Lynch, right. and uh, Terence Gallagher, mm -hmm. and uh, what do you see, There's a, there was a couple of the Wolfsons, Mervyn and Jim Wilson lived across the road from us, and, and uh, the Lynches then, and, and there's still some of them still living in, in Brook Park, you know, to this day, mm -hmm. so... Uh, then we had Bingo McHugh, you know, Cutie's brother, That's Bingo, right. he lived just down at the bottom. That's so right. we had all a good squad, a good group along that area. And we used to be a lot of football matches at Brook Park against the Gorbals, we called it, which was the boys over in Young Crescent. Right. So that was good. And we used to play all the matches at Edwards. They had a wee football pitch right. there, a wee pitch. Right. So there were some some tough matches there every month or so. Now, what, primary school, what primary school did you go to then? Primary school, I went to uh, what's now as uh, the schoolhouse bar. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was growing up there. You had uh, crossed the road. You your the, your highlight was getting across from there to Jeff McCarran's shop for a quarter of sweets. Mm -hmm. And uh, the year that I left primary seven to go to St Eugene's was the year that St. Pat's New School opened up the Castlefin Road, so I never got, never, we missed out on that. Mm -hmm. Who was the principal of, of uh, the primary school? The principal was Master McGoldrick, John McGoldrick. Mm -hmm. so Any other teachers that you remember? Oh, I do indeed. Uh, I'll give you my first memory of starting school, for start, was our good neighbour and a good friend of mine as well, was uh, Anthony McAvoy's mother. Bridget McAvoy, who still lives down at the bottom of Brook Park there on the Castlefin Road, mm -hmm. next door to uh, John McHugh, the bicycle man's right. house. My first day at school, I always remember. Well, I'm, I'm uh, second youngest out of eight family. There's five girls and three boys, and I was the second youngest, but 
I always remember my first day going down to school, my mother walked me down down the road from Brook, Brook Park down to school at the bottom of the hill. Yeah. And, and uh, i never forget it, Mrs McAvoy took me in and uh, I didn't want to go to school, Jared. Did not want to go. I remember crying and Mrs McAvoy saying to me that, oh, he'll be grand. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll never forget this. God rest, prim primary one and primary two was in the same class. Mm -hmm. And God rest, Deck McGear. Do you remember Deck was killed in a car crash? Right. And was it Lascouli? Sam McGear's brother. And uh, I remember saying to Mrs McAvoy, I wanted to go to the toilet. Mm -hmm. Never forget, it's funny how things stick out in your mind. But uh, she asked Deck, Deck McGear to take me out to the toilet. And as soon as I got out into the toilet, you know, you had to go out of the building and across over into another building, you see. Oh, yeah. Once I made my way in towards the toilet, I made the dash up the road. And I remember Deck made a, made a, a grab for me and I kicked him in the shins and ran up the road. And I'll never forget it. Uh, my mother I opened the back door and my mother was taking off her coat. Oh, yeah. So that was my first day of school. And Mrs McAvoy coming running up the hill after me. I remember saying, Law, let him stay now to dinner time and bring him back after dinner. So that's my first memory of, of, of school. But you had Mrs. McAvoy, you had Mrs. Keenan from Drumquan. I think she died there maybe a couple of years ago. Right. Uh, you had Mrs. Carlin, Pat Carlin, Tony Carlin's sister of the pub. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. McAnay, Mary McAnay, who's still, still living. living. Right. And we had uh, Master McGoldrick. So that was the teachers in there at that time, mm -hmm. as far as I can remember now. Who would have been in the sort of your contemporary in the class, like in the sort of same year as you, you sort of I, remember? And well, primary school, I suppose, and them days in the same class as me now was, uh, you had the likes of Francie Lynch, Paul and Charlie's oh, wow. brother Francie, mm -hmm. and uh, we had Scratch McGoldrick, mm -hmm. Paddy Carlin, Tony, the son, the, the, the pub's son, uh, Bingo McHugh, uh, Brenton Harper, and uh, I see now a few of the girls. There was, I remember Anne Marie Coyle, who's married to Dennis Doan, and uh, we had We Mary McHugh, uh, Hilary, and, oh, and them's sister, Mary's and Derry now. Uh, Mary's a, a barrister, I think, That's or right, something. Yeah. And, uh, she was in the, the air. Uh, was a flight one time. Aye, ah, that's right. Oh. That is right. So we had the likes of Mary McHugh and with Michael Rankin, Philom who got married, I think Philomena. No, Michael. There was twins. Michael. Michael. Mickey Rankin and uh, there was twins. I can't remember now. But uh, there was a squad like that. And then I suppose when we moved to St Eugene's, then the circle widened. Then the oh, friends oh, oh, oh. widened. You know, because you had ones from Ahi Arn and and yeah. and around then. You know. So, uh, St Eugene, who was the principal then when you were? The principal <laughs> in St Eugene's when I started was uh, Master McLaughlin. And no harm, I hope nobody minds, but they, we called him Snowball. That's correct. Yeah. And uh, my first day as well, there's, there we go again. First days at school wasn't a great one for me. My first day at school, Jared, uh, I walked in to St Eugene's. And there was no such thing in them days as... Uh, getting to the school you know previous beforehand to see what it looked like you just you went and that was it so i remember i walked into the gym and i seen this massive big gymnasium and uh, i saw the basketball rings and stuff and i said oh my god this is amazing and i ran up the stage up to the top of the stage jumped up onto the stage and climbed up and i jumped up onto the basketball ring and all i remember was Snowball, you boy, come to my office. <laughs> so I got three in each hand that day, the strap, and I wasn't in the school in more than 20 minutes. So that was my first day at St Eugene's. Yeah. So, there you are. Oh, teachers at St Eugene's that you remember? Uh, I really had a great time at St Eugene's, but to be honest, I loved sport. Mm -hmm. So Charlie Gallon for me, was uh, number one. Because he was great, great PE instructor and a great, and turned out to be a great friend as well. And I played golf and stuff with him when I left school. But you know, in those days, you had Charlie Gallon, you had uh, Frank McDade, mm -hmm. as I say, Master McLaughlin, Brenton Ronan, who then was principal in our day as well, a lovely man as well. And uh, with the likes of 
at that time it was Miss McGinley, Clep Rush. She was there. Mm-hmm. And uh, to be honest, I'd, I'd say she's not that much older than me, so she must have been very young whenever she started teaching. She taught art. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, she just come in, you know, uh, there was a different art teacher there before her, but she come in and then we had big Pat McYarn from Dermore. He died, the man died of cancer. A nice big man, he was a mm-hmm. science teacher and and uh, there was a Carmel McGarvey. She taught PE to the girls mm-hmm. and she actually married Pat McYarn. So she's still living now, but uh, they must have met at school, like, and they got married. But I say he died as a young, a young man. Mm-hmm. But there was other wee John Teig from oh the Moor, a uh, yeah. geography teacher. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I see who else we had a good Mary Bridget McSorley. Mm-hmm. She taught us as well. Bernie Gallon, Bernie Mungan, mm-hmm. and uh, when I see now, there's big Vincent Thornton. Lovely man, history teacher, right. a real gentleman. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure there's quite a few more as yeah. well, you know, on oh, top of that there. Bad. But that's ones that, mm-hmm. that that rings a bell for me. So you, know? you felt anyway, you had a good time at St. Eugene's? I had a great time. I loved St. Eugene's, yeah. I really did. And I say, PE was what I really, yeah. that was my number one thing, you know. I remember a photograph on the hair, you mentioned Brendan Harper, like for Brendon and Trescott Woody, or the one of basketball league or something. Uh, I was in that team. I was. Yeah. I was indeed. Uh, I remember we went. I think we went two years or something unbeaten in the basketball league. But I remember always Charlie Gallon telling that year of our guys. You know, we, it was the best oh, that he had. You know, he likes it. Myself and Tar Lynch, mm-hmm. Bingo McHugh, Brenton Harper, Francie Lynch, Jer Doan from Ahi Iron, uh, Dennis Doan, we Sean, we Shawnee Brown, mm-hmm. John Goan. Uh, God rest Dennis Carlin, Denny Carlin. Uh, Dennis was a great wee footballer too in his day, you know, and uh, um, a couple of other boys too. Uh, we Paddy McGlynn, you know, that does the cars. Frank McGlynn's son oh, was in our, my uh, class. Paddy Baxter, if you remember him. I remember him too. We Paddy. So, uh, and a lot of girls. Uh, the likes of Anne Marie, who's married to Dennis okay, Doan. Hmm. And we had uh, Carmel Ramsey. Siobhan Bradley, who's married to Wally John McGuckin now, oh. and Jill Donaghy. Mm-hmm. Jill Donaghy would be Gloria's right. sister, and well, I think there was 30 something in our class, you know. But as I say, Paddy Devaney here from Spamount. Uh, good good memories from the place. Oh, it was great. I loved St. Eugene's. That was so when you left St. Eugene's, what? I left St. Eugene's, and uh, I remember. I worked always with uh, my brother John at the cars, mm-hmm. at the bodywork. Yes. So uh, I always went straight from St Eugene's uh, to uh, up to Ballantyne's Yard. It was where John worked at the cars in them days. So yeah. I'd have been working from after school till bedtime there, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, funny enough, then this a couple of months after I left St Eugene's, there was a job came up, and. Uh, it was in St Eugene's, oh. and it was, uh, I can't remember now the exact uh, job title of it, but it was it was uh, recording programmes on TV and helping with the science class, you know, being a, like an assistant there. Uh, Master Thornton, the history teacher, as I say, helping him out and helping John Francis McHugh as well, the woodwork oh. teacher. He came in after there was a woodwork teacher left and John Francis came in helping out with him and stuff like that. There was a name to it, a, a very nice title it was, I can't remember it now, but mm. I actually applied for that job and, a, and a, even though I wanted to work at the cars, but I mm. thought I'll apply for this job anyway, and I got it. Yes. So uh, the likes of Francie Lynch and there was a couple of the ones like that there stayed on an extra year to do more O-levels. So uh, I was working in the school and they were still there. So it was a very strange sort of feeling. Uh, I was supposed to go up to the teacher's area in the dining room mm. and uh, eat along with them, but I used to go and sit with Francie and, and my, my ex-schoolmates because I, I just I didn't feel the same. Yeah. you know. And then in the dining room, I remember there was Mrs. Marion, Marion McGlynn, Marion McGlynn's mother right. uh, from Alexander Park. She was a, she was a, Marion Nichols, her name now. Yes. From uh, her, she was the head of the the 
the dining room, you know. Mm -hmm. And in them days, you had to go into the dining room and you had four people on either side on the long table and then two at each end. Uh, yeah. I remember Francie Lynch and me would always have sat together at school. Yeah. So you, Mrs. McGlynn always picked people to serve out the dinner. Mm -hmm. So Francie and me always picked the girls. Yeah. We picked four girls on either side because the girls didn't eat desserts. So uh, we always got extra helpings and then some of them didn't want yeah. some dinner either. So yes. what you done in those days, Jared, was uh, at, our, at school in them days was they set you out trays of spuds and then your veg or your, your mm -hmm. meat and all and you divided them into pieces and then you put it out into each chair. So, 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 so it was great that the girls then, they didn't want yeah. to make feed. So Francie and me was well fed. <laughs> 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 So, well, Francie yeah. must have got a good trap. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Francie and me was sort of best mates at school. Then, mm -hmm. so then you moving on from from uh, would you, did you stay long with this assistant job or this job in there? No, I stayed nine mm -hmm. months. Right. I stayed nine months because my first love was cars, mm. and I, even when I finished work uh, at St Eugene's every day, I still went out. Then to help John in the garage after that. Mm -hmm. So nine months later, then I packed it in, and actually, we Francie McGranahan got my job. All right. Yeah. And Francie was there for for years, yeah, for a long time. Yeah. So, so I was the first person to, to get that job in St Eugene's, and mm -hmm. then Francie took over for me. Mm -hmm. So there you go. So you moved you moved back then working with John and that there. I did. I moved. That Val you mentioned Valentine's Yard to, to them that doesn't know where where was it. Right. Valentine's Yard is up uh, near the police station. Uh, it would be where that car park is now across the road from Denny McCrory's. Yeah, yeah. You know the car park in there and then there's still a yard in there yes, indeed, yeah. which was Valentine's Yard. I think Lowry's have bought it over now. Mm -hmm. And be, uh, yeah. it was in there. We had a, a garage in there and uh, beside us was uh, at the start we had a boy, a boy called Joe McGlinchey, Joe Punctures. He had a uh, puncture business repair. Right. And then Mickey Michael Kerr, he bought it of him. He oh, took right. over. Oh, no, no, Mickey. So uh, that's what we had in there. There was two businesses going yeah. in there. Some good times too. Oh, yeah. Well, then you kept working at the cars. You up to, up to, you still, maybe you're still at the cars. I'm still foot there in an odd bit at the cars. Yeah, yeah the yeah. body work. Uh, and, yeah. uh, well, I moved to England. Now, I met Elner. Elner was only 17 years of age and I was 20, so early 80s we moved to Coventry, my sister Anne. Mm -hmm. Anne would be the second oldest in our family and she's lived in Coventry for, for many a year now. Mm -hmm. Anne ended up in Coventry, I'll just tell you this one. Jared, uh, my sister Anne and her first cousin, Gwen Coulter, which was uh, Cecil Coulter, is uh, my uncle Cecil Coulter's wife, Teed, and my mother were sisters. All right. Well, and uh, their daughter, Gwen and Anne, first cousins, decided they were going to move to England. Yes. And uh, they got a pen one day and they had a map of England and the, Anne closed her eyes and she dabbed and it landed in Coventry. And that was... Anne is, what, now about 63 years of age, and I think she's in Coventry since she was 20. Very good. So she's been there a long time. And uh, as I say, getting back to the story, uh, you know. John, uh, my brother John then uh, had moved, he, he had moved away to England for a while and then came back. And I got a job in between that when John left to go to England. Ken Irwin asked me would I work for him. So I worked with Ken Irwin for a few years at the mm -hmm. cars as well. And I remember I had two weeks holidays and uh, I said to Elner at the time, we'll go over to my sister Anne. So as I say, Elner was only 17 and I was 20. And, and uh, we went away on a week's holidays and uh, we liked it. Mm -hmm. And we stayed three and a half years in Coventry. I got a job, I got a job working at the cars over there. Hmm. And Elner got a job in the tax office in Coventry. She had just finished her A levels, mm -hmm. and uh, we stayed there for three and a half years, and came back, came back home again in nineteen eighty six because Elner's mother uh, had took a couple of wee strokes. Mm -hmm. So Elner's father is was Peter Lennon from the crew, oh, <laughs> married, Peter. married to Sidney Collins, Collins, the Collinses mm -hmm. from the crew. Mm -hmm. So Elner's mother took a couple of wee strokes and stuff. So. Elner was thinking about 
moving back home and mm -hmm. then we were we were getting married as well. Mm -hmm. So we come back in 86 and John, in that period of time since that, had bought a house across the road from me here. Right. Uh, the two story house here. Across from the co-op. Spam out co-op. And uh, John had built a, a, a garage there mm -hmm. and John had asked me then would I be interested in coming home and working for him mm -hmm. again. So that was sort of everything oh, worked out. And yeah. Eleanor applied for a transfer on on grounds of her mother not been well. So she was in the civil service and she got uh, she got a job then in the Randall office. Good. So that meant that the two of us were coming straight back home to employment, mm -hmm. which was very important. Well, sure, they were uh, And uh, we got married then in 1987. Right. And Paddy Devaney, my old schoolmate, yes, indeed. he lived here. Oh, is this the house? This was Paddy Devaney's bungalow. Oh. And me and Paddy was good friends and some <coughs> scenes as well. But when I had come home, uh, I was living back up in Brook Park again with my mm. mother and father for a few months till I would get married. But we were looking out for a house, Eleanor and me. And I remember somebody saying to me uh, that Paddy Denny was supposed to be selling his house. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, looking out for Paddy and uh, going seeking him out and saying to him, Paddy, is it true you're interested in selling? Because this house was only about a year old, you know. Muldoon's um, building was, was and, and Paddy worked for Muldoon. Right. Still does, I think. But uh, cut a long story short, Jared, uh, we ended up we bought the house before Paddy put it on the market. Hmm. So we done a, a, a deal, and so with the house and all bought before we got married, and uh, it was handy being close across oh, the road to work that. with John, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, that's a few years ago now because the mortgage has ended about uh, I would say four, four and a half, five years ago. Good feeling. Lovely feeling. I have to say, that well, is great. Is. that's a great relief off the shoulders. So, uh, it's a bike, go out of your bike. Uh, for yeah. sure. Yeah. So then, you, you, you had, you were married in 87, you were saying? I was married in 87, and uh, as I say, Eleanor worked in the Dole office, and I was working over there with John. Mm. And uh, to be honest, we had a good time. We went on two or two foreign holidays every year. And uh, enjoyed ourselves, yeah. had a good time and then five years later you know uh, we decided I suppose it was time maybe to settle down a bit and uh, mm -hmm. Eleanor got pregnant and uh, mm -hmm. 1992 we had our one and only child born Rachel. Right. So uh, 23rd of January 1992 Rachel was born and uh, it was quite a shock. Uh, most people in the Castleberry and surrounding area would know now that uh, Rachel was diagnosed at six weeks old, dear, with cystic fibrosis. Mm, yeah. So that was a major shock to the system, I'll have to tell you. Yeah. And, uh, we knew nothing about cystic fibrosis, hadn't got a clue what it was. Right. And all we did know at that time, Jared, was that uh, my sister, Clet was going out with a fellow Declan Devine at that time, who mm. she's married to now. Yeah. And Declan's brother died that week of cystic fibrosis mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the week that uh, Rachel was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis and he was 16 oh, yes, right. and that's all we knew about it so mm. to us it was like a death in the family. Oh, it was sort of a teenage death coming and I'll never forget it that Father Mullen who was our priest up here in Drum the Bay mm -hmm. who, who married us a lovely big man mm. and uh, he landed at the house here and my mother and father and Eleanor's mother and father and all our brothers and sisters of both sides of the family and just I remember it, and Rachel was just a wee baby, and uh, I remember, just remember it, and had the priest saying prayers, and me saying to him, you know, was there a God up there at all, mm -hmm. you know? So that was tough times, dear, as you say, and uh, changed the whole focus on life too. Changed easy. completely, completely <laughs> turn around, complete mm -hmm. turn around, I have to say, mm -hmm. and I remember after coming from Belfast that day, going up to get a test done and all, and then they rang, you see, and. Uh, I remember Dr. O'Hare knocking at the back door and coming in and just shaking his head, you know, Brenton O'Hare, mm. and him saying, I'm so sorry, you know, that's what it was, but we had to go straight back up to Belfast that night, mm -hmm. and we stayed there for, I think it was over a week, to learn all about cystic fibrosis, yeah. how to cope with it, and, and how to deal 
with having Rachel and, yes, and what it entailed, you know. So it was scary even leaving. We didn't want to leave Belfast mm -hmm. after that week because we felt just it was like a safe haven. And protected. And we felt protected. Mm -hmm. And we felt that, you know, if we go home now, what happens if uh, we have to talk to a doctor or speak to a nurse, you know, and yeah. it was scary. Yeah. But, you know, life, life went on through and, uh, you know, some many ups and downs. Like, if you, you know, to move forward, not, no, no, we'll, we'll go back there, but just to move from then to now in your mind, mm -hmm. you've achieved and she has achieved an awful lot. Like, Definitely. You, you couldn't uh, have foresaw that no. in 1992. Like. No. You know, well, Liam, you mentioned there that in 1992, you, uh, Rachel was born, and mm. then you went to Belfast to get a sort of, a, a, a sort of an informed about the condition. And yep. uh, coming back again to Spamond, um, what was it like, say, the first year or two, adjusting? Um, I would say, Jared, the first year or two was far from easy. Mm. It was just learning how to live and cope with a child with cystic fibrosis and you know if she coughed if Rachel coughed or if she moved in her sleep at night you know you were panicking thinking is this her going to have to end up in hospital and mm -hmm. you know things like that there and uh, it was just it's just it was a constant worry yeah. you know and uh, then as well I suppose having to having to give her medication and stuff uh, people with cystic fibrosis we didn't know at that time as well their digestive system doesn't work people just thinks that cystic fibrosis is all about the, the lungs mm. and that is all about the lungs because they're prone to chest infections yeah, and yeah. stuff like that but uh, as well as that you know their their digestive system doesn't work mm -hmm. so if they were to eat something like me or you eat our dinner now uh, if they were to eat their dinner without proper medication it would just go straight through them right. so rachel had to then take tablets called uh, enzymes Right. And which digests the food and works the pancreas and all and and makes it all work so we at a very young age a, a newborn baby you know at the start as well having to get tablets into them that they didn't know how to swallow and stuff uh, that was very hard mm. so it was just a learning process and a learning curve and mm -hmm. and then doing regular physiotherapy mm -hmm. in the morning first thing then maybe in the afternoon and then at bedtime at night, so you had three times a day of this, and those days it was, you know, holding the child over on your knee in different angles, mm -hmm. and doing all this patting, you know, and the, the yes. tapping like that there to, to try and, and get rid of any uh, uh, mucus on the lungs, you know, and uh, it was just a daily, constant routine, and I suppose in the end of it just became a way of life for us, yes. you know. Mm -hmm. But, no, I would call it very, very difficult times, well, yes. without doubt. Now, most people that know Liam McHugh know Liam for running. Mm -hmm. Like you're the, mm -hmm. the, long, the loneliness of the long distance runner, definitely. Uh, you're on that Castle Derg's Straban Road pretty often. Uh, and where did that start? Or was that was it around that time it started? Or? It was around that time I when, when Rachel was born. You had uh, the, my brother John, God rest him, who, who died there just over a year ago. And most people would know John, I would say, was one of the top runners that this Castle Dare Gipper produced. Yeah. And then the old legend himself, Mr. Pat O'Loughlin here. Yes, so Pat, uh, they were two of the men that would have been, you know, the local heroes in Castle Dare. And, and Pat still is today, oh, as we all know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, I remember at that time, you know, John saying to me, you know, he says, what about... What about maybe us organising something like uh, in the Belfast Marathon coming up now? And I looked at him and said, John, I couldn't run the length of myself. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, what about the relay? So 1993, Belfast 1993, John organised it in Pat. And uh, I think there was about 48 or 50 of us went up on a, on a coach load. Mm -hmm. And we had several relay teams. And that year... John done the full marathon, of course, and Pat done the full marathon. And I think you'd Gloria Donaghy done the full marathon, and maybe Annie Deary. And there was Martin McGrath. Marty was a butcher and uh, McHugh's oh, yeah. cost cutters. I remember. And that, I, I think it might have been his first and only marathon. And uh, he done the full marathon. And 
there was a few other ones as well at that time. Uh, there was a fella, Sean Rowan from Oma, and, and a few boys about at that time, maybe Harry McTeeth and a few ones like that. But they done the full marathon, and then we gathered up, uh, as I say, these relay the teams. Groups, yeah. mm-hmm. And uh, we done it for cystic fibrosis that year, mm-hmm. all of us. And uh, I think we raised just over £3,000, 1993. And that was the start, I suppose, of my journey of, of running. And uh, uh, at school, I hated, I hated running. It was all football, yes. volleyball, basketball, mm-hmm. table tennis, all that. And I hated running at school. But uh, then, whenever I found then uh, that John was taking me out running on a regular basis, I started to grow to like it when I got older, you know. And, and then... Charlie Gall said one time, you won a cross-country race. <laughs> I... Uh, I suppose you could say I did, maybe, but uh, I, uh, I'll tell you that story all right. Uh, as I said, I just absolutely hated running at school. It was the worst thing for me ever. Mm-hmm. So uh, this day, in a way, uh, we were told that we were doing cross-country, and that was running out round the roads there. We went out of the gates at St Eugene's and, and uh, up round up towards John Doherty's house there, and, and as soon as we reached the crossroads there, you turned left. Mm-hmm. Turned left down to the very bottom of that road to that sharp corner that brought you onto the Kalita Road, you know, and back and yeah, round. Yeah. So that was right round the full circle. But I remember this day anyway, and uh, there was a young bread man, and he wasn't long on the scene at that time, a Mother's Pride bread van. Mm-hmm. And it was Ken Baxter. Oh, I and uh, this day anyway, I was out, and as I say, I hated running and flagged Ken down, and, and I jumped into the bread van beside Ken. I says, Ken, are you heading in towards the town? And he says, Am I? I says, give me a lift. I'll never forget it. Ken took me right up to, to the, I think it was a 30 mile sign or whatever, getting near the finish line of, of the of the cross country and Charlie Gallon would have been on up a few hundred yards up above, you know. And yes. I says, Ken, leave, leave me off here now. So I waited and uh, I looked behind and I seen some of the boys coming, you know. Right. So then I ran on in as if I won the race, you know. <laughs> and Charlie, I remember Charlie saying to me, well done. Yeah. Well done, Liam. Good run, good run. And I had to let on, I was sweating, you know, and yeah. stuff. Yeah. But when it come to it, the boys told Charlie, anyway, uh, Master Gallon, sorry, in them days, uh, they told Master Gallon that uh, that Liam McHugh boy got a lift with Ken Baxter, the bread van, <laughs> the bread man. And uh, I'm afraid I had to do the whole run again, Jared, myself. Oh, he yeah. made me do it all over again, so I was caught. Oh, <laughs> oh, good, good crack. But on to, the, on to them. Yeah, and throughout the 90s, you've been, like, when would have been your first full marathon? Well, would you believe it? You know, I didn't do my first full marathon for several years after that, even though I'd done a lot of running. Yes. I started, I took up running, as I say, from 93 on, and, and I'd, done, I'd done a lot of 10Ks and different stuff like that and fundraising for mm-hmm. cystic fibrosis. Yes. Uh, but we did do a lot of fundraising, other things like... Uh, uh, we had a Miss Cyan Mills. I'm, I'd be chairman of the Cyan Mills branch of the Cystic Fibrosis Trust this 23 years. Yes. Still am. Mm-hmm. But we done a lot of fundraising, you know, like Miss Cyan Mills and different things that was on the Jerry Kelly show live and all. Yeah. Uh, so I spent several years doing different fundraising things and a few 10Ks and, and uh, relays and stuff over marathons and stuff like that. But I didn't do my first full marathon until actually... Uh, my early 40s mm-hmm. so I'm 55 now coming shortly so uh, 15 marathons later right enough but yes. uh, my early 40s and it was the Dublin marathon was my first marathon and uh, I always remember training for that and uh, John my brother warning me he said you know save something for the last 10k yes. he says a marathon only starts at 20 miles yeah. and I remember that and that stuck out in my mind but I remember on my first marathon, I went out and I ran three hours and 17 minutes. And uh, he talked about this wall that you hit on. You know, the wall never come, Jerry. Right. The wall never come. And I always then thought, oh, I should have went harder. I could have went harder. But every single marathon I've done since that first marathon, I've hit the wall big oh, time. Yeah, I think the unknown in my first marathon maybe made it that bit easier. But knowing what I had ahead from then on, I've hit the wall big time. So, you've you been know, roughly about 17 years now? 15, 15 now, this year, when I do, I'll be doing the London Marathon now on Sunday week, which is only, this is what day is this, Thursday, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sunday week. So, 
so this will be marathon number 15 and uh, I think it's, it'll be my 8th London marathon I've been a couple of Dublins and Belfast and uh, New Race right. and uh, New York I'm New York uh, but London has been my favourite you know New York has been unbelievable but I just I love London it's just uh, it's a great atmosphere as well mm -hmm. and uh, I suppose it's been in your case it's mainly for a uh, uh, for cystic fibrosis. Well, I suppose, let's put it this way, Jared. when Rachel was born 24 years ago, mm -hmm. life expectancy for somebody with cystic fibrosis in those days was around 16 years of age. Yes. Rachel's 24 today, mm -hmm. and uh, any money that I raise goes into cystic fibrosis, the Cystic Fibrosis Trust, which goes to research. And uh, you know they've they've come on so so far now, and uh, as I say, Rachel's twenty four. She's achieved so much in her short life. Like uh, she went to the wee school, stood across the road, drummed away, mm -hmm. and uh, I even remember in them days Harry McAnee saying that all they had in there was a coal fire and it was awful with smoke fumes, mm -hmm. and uh, it was I said to Harry at that time, you know that there's no way Rachel could go to that school. Mm -hmm. And I remember Harry putting the case forward, you know, to the Western Education Board mm. about Rachel. Imagine somebody living straight across the road that won't be able to go to the school because of the conditions of the school. And, and they got the heating in, you know, before mm. Rachel started. Mm. So that was a good boost for the school as well, you know. And it meant Rachel went to the school. But Rachel achieved her, her uh, A and her 11 plus. Right. And uh, she didn't want to go to the convent. Yes. Because of the fact that physiotherapy in the morning would have meant that she would have had to been up from six o'clock in the morning to do her physio, mm -hmm. to get the bus out here yes. at twenty to eight in the morning. So that wasn't really, no, it wasn't workable. And Rachel didn't want to go. She says, "I want to go to St Eugene's," yeah. and for us, we felt more at home, knowing that if there was a problem with Rachel and her health, that I could just jump into the car and head out to St Eugene's. And I went to the school, and I loved the school. Charlie was principal around that time. Charlie, uh, Charlie, I think was was maybe. Well, no, I'll him. tell you that year that Rachel joined the school, Charlie retired, ah. and I think it might have been. John Hollywell. It was, mm -hmm. it was indeed, and then uh, Master Tuck, right. after him, good man, good man as well, was very good to Rachel. Oh, but yeah. uh, you know, I remember people saying to me, "Oh, you're not sending your cutie to that school there because." Uh, her getting an A in the 11 plus mm -hmm. and uh, you know those same people when St Eugene's closed were the first people there to, to start complaining about the school closing but they were sending all their children to Oma mm -hmm. and you can't have it both ways. I was so glad that Rachel went to that school mm -hmm. and Rachel went on to do her uh, GCSEs in St Eugene's and she obtained something like uh, four A stars, mm -hmm. four A's and a B, and she got the academic student of the year, mm -hmm. and she had she come home that night from the prize given with mm -hmm. three cups with her and yeah. two plaques, and mm -hmm. she cleaned up best this and that, and that was a proud oh, yeah. day for me. And uh, oh, I just sure. thought to myself, these people that was telling me, "Don't be sending your daughter there," oh, I was very glad yeah. that she went. That's, and yeah. you know, after that, Jared, sorry, but she went on. Uh, she had to go to the convent to do her A levels. Uh -huh and uh, she done that and then she took a year out wasn't sure what to do but uh, she decided then she'd go to McGee and Derry yeah. and uh, from that and McGee she's obtained her degree in psychology and there in December past uh, we went for her uh, what do you call graduation. it graduation mm -hmm. couldn't get the word there uh, she went for a graduation in December for her masters in psychology and she got first class honours with yeah. distinction oh, and good. she finished off the ceremony that day she had to sit up on the stage beside all the professors and all and she closed the ceremony with a closing speech mm. and that was a proud day oh, as well yeah. nice. and then uh, Rachel now is doing a PhD oh, in psychology as well and there was one place available down in McGee which was fully funded yes. uh, which pays you for doing it and uh, there was one place available and Rachel done the interview and got it mm. so in three years time I'll be very proud to say please God 
that she'll be have the title of Dr. Rachel McHugh. And as I say, 24 years ago, life expectancy was 16. And now, look oh, where she is today. And I think it's all down to that money that was raised, you know, for cystic fibrosis and, and research, mm -hmm. you know. Yes. So, no, very proud, or very proud. Oh, yeah, and rightly so. <coughs> yeah. Well, most mm. people know, would know you, like, I mean, I wouldn't know you as well as the other two brothers, but most people that knows you well would say you're, you're a very strong faith and so is, uh, you know, mm. Elmer. Without doubt. You know, they, they say Liam would be a very, he'd be one of the best family men that they know. Mm, he well. Would, he would have a good word on his family and he would get emphasis on his family. Mm. His family is number one. And well, doubt, doubt, I. Yeah, well, faith is. We were just mentioning the faith. Would it been important? This is important, or very important, yeah. very important. And as I said, I went back that time saying to Father Mullen that time, is there a God out there? Mm. You know, because of the fact that I just couldn't believe that Rachel was born with this condition, and you know, I just didn't know. But I have to say, if it wasn't for our faith, Elner and myself, uh, it probably I don't know how I'd have got through this. You know, because, you know, what, if you don't have your faith in, in times of need, you know, you have nothing. So God, you know, and I do feel that we have been blessed now at that time. You know, I remember Father Mullen saying to me, and at the time I didn't r believe it, but I remember him saying to me, he said, Liam, sometimes God gives us these crosses to bear because he knows we can carry them. And it didn't feel like that at the time, Jared. You know. But I remember those words, yeah. and looking back at that now, I suppose 24 years later, maybe God did give us that well, cross to bear because we, he knew we could carry it. And I suppose looking back at that now today, uh, 120 odd thousand pound later raised that I, we, I have raised for cystic fibrosis through mainly marathons. And where Rachel is today, maybe it is faith and all the rest of it, and I was given that cross to bear that for a reason. Sissy, I was had to come into your sort of uh, life. Hmm. And you don't know what, what about you know, how your life might have been. Wouldn't you have know. a clue. Why? Nobody knows. These are Nobody things. knows. Aye. You know, it works in a serious way. That is right, aye, for sure. But it is, it is, you know, people would they sort of ridicule faith and they say, oh, no, that's a no hopers job, but it isn't. Mm. You know, and it is a good feeling. Oh, without doubt. But, no. Uh, you know. you have that with your family, like it's, uh, you cannot. Mm-hmm, without doubt. Right. Now, when you moved on, or when you uh, into the, and uh, you raised, or the, your group has raised a, a, a massive amount of money, mm -hmm. you've been credited then with a lot of uh, awards and distinctions and that there. Mm -hmm. I know that it's hard to know which is top, but it, could you just sort of tell us some of the ones, some of the awards you've received? Well, I suppose last year, uh, I got into the final of the Pride of Britain Awards, the UTV, yeah, uh, and they come here and done an interview, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, that was nice to be recognised. But nice, yeah. for me, it's cystic fibrosis awareness. That's okay. what I do. And uh, I suppose, I would say now, the biggest one, I suppose, now is uh, I'm off to uh, Buckingham Palace now next month for, uh, I've got an honour, the Queen's New Year's Honours list. Right. So it's a British Empire medal, yeah, uh, a BEM, and uh, for me, I'm proud to accept that honour, Jared, because of the fact of for cystic fibrosis and yeah, what, and to be recognised, oh, oh. to be recognised by by the community, okay. and uh, you know it's it's so important as I say, raising awareness for cystic fibrosis, and and I think we've moved on in life nowadays too that uh, that that everybody recognises this award today. And I have people from all all angles coming and congratulating on me uh, for it, and that's that's very nice too. You I don't know. know that, like, uh, say, if anybody wants to know anything about cystic fibrosis, the first ma name that comes to comes around Castle there, they're or say mm. uh, Liam McKee. <laughs> because of your your putting it to the front. Uh, I'm sounding like Pew McCann now. Like, right. <laughs> you put no. it to the forefront all the time. Right. It's not yourself. It's the, it's the uh, well, so. to be honest. I uh, I would now, I would safely say I dedicate my life now yeah. to raising money for cystic fibrosis, and mm -hmm. I'm not going to I'm not going to give up until I would say there's a cure Please found. Yeah. And Rachel is on a drug at the minute yes. called Orcambe. Yeah. 
Yes. And it's a it's a new drug that Rachel done trials there for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a life changer. You're saying that. Yes. I have to say it's been a total complete life changer. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example of this Orkambi drug. It's an American based firm, and their their name is Vertex. And as I say, uh, Rachel was asked to take part in these trials two and a half years ago, and she said yes, and I'm glad that she did. But uh, what has happened since those trials is uh, Rachel's lung functions has risen by 19%, which is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. That is big for somebody living with cystic fibrosis. And people with cystic fibrosis would have a lot of bother putting on weight. Yeah. Rachel's weight gain has risen by... She's put on up to a stone weight. Right. And as well, people living with cystic fibrosis are inclined to catch a lot of coughs and colds mm -hmm. that yeah. can turn into uh, chest infections, right. with the, which ends up being hospital admissions. Mm -hmm. So since that, or can be, you know, Rachel, in those two and a half years, has picked up very little coughs and colds. Mm -hmm. So this drug has kept stuff like that as b at bay, as well as risen her lung functions and ma making her gain weight. So uh, that has given Rachel now even the strength to go on ahead. As she said, she couldn't have done that master's and do this PhD no. only for that, that tablet the, or can be. But that drug trial's ended now, yes. two and a half years later. And the problem is now we need to try and get it funded by the NHS. Yes. Uh, it's costing £104,000 a year mm -hmm. to fund it. So last there three weeks ago, the NHS turned it down. Mm -hmm. So that's a big thing on the Cystic Fibrosis Trust Day, and they said it was too expensive. So uh, I was up there seeing a couple of uh, MPs and stuff, uh, and I've had a, a chat up at a couple of their offices, and there are things in limbo at the minute with elections going on, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. they're hoping that if they're re-elected that they're going to take it all the way to Stormont and maybe invite me and Eleanor and Rachel up to Stormont to talk to the health minister and stuff like that. So I think they're looking for this American firm to drop their price as well, the NHS, and it's mm -hmm. a bargaining thing at the minute, but, you know... It would be a good pity if, if, that, were, if, if, if that condition, if the drug was withdrawn or, or because of money. Like that would be awful. Oh. And as I say all along, if there was a war starting in, oh. in Iraq or Afghanistan tomorrow morning or whatever, Billions. It wouldn't even be thought about. Uh, One hundred and four thousand would be like a drop in the a drop in the ocean. Pennies. And as you so, know, you, the, the the drug firm initially that will be the price, but that'll, that'll, it will drop. It will drop. Uh, that's is what we we've, we've been told. I know we were hopeful. They were trying to get more negotiations. Money and then uh, once they get that back, the price will drop. That's right. So we're keeping our fingers crossed. But the good news too is this American firm, Vertex, because Rachel took part in the trials. Hmm. They have kept her on the drug, right. even though it's finished. The trials is finished. But because Rachel's story has been such a huge success, it's so good looking for yeah. them that it'd be bad for them taking her off. Mm -hmm. And there was a bit of a hiccup there because when the trials finished, we were told that Rachel was keeping on the trials. But we went up, when we went up to Belfast, that day of her trials finishing, we were to lift her new uh, the, the supply of drugs. Mm -hmm. But they weren't there. And they didn't come for three weeks. Hmm. And uh, Belfast City Hospital rang us then to say they'd come in. And three weeks later, without Rachel being on the or can be, they took her lung functions and they dropped in those three weeks by 13%. So that was a massive, massive difference. So it just shows you oh, how yeah. much this this, mm. this drug or can be works. Yes, indeed. So please God. We can get it, get it uh, funded by the NHS and get everybody living with cystic fibrosis right. on it, oh, yeah, hopefully. because it's. I just call it a wonder drug, mm -hmm. you know. Getting back to your own preparation, right. say for, for for marathons and that there. What would that entail? Like, mm -hmm. Would you set yourself like? I mean, you you know you're going one now in the end of April, be in the May that that May. Twenty uh, fourth April. Twenty fourth April. Mm. What? I mean, for that marathon, when would your training sort of begin, or does, does, does your training ever end? It's sort of, you would say it never ends. Yeah. It never ends. Six day, I would run six days a week. Right. I always take one day a week off, but uh, marathon training would start a bit more serious there. Say for London, now on the 24th of April, the marathon training would start normally always around the first week in January. Mm -hmm. So it's all them wet one day, one their mornings. Really? 
mm. you know, out early in the morning, you know, out running, and it, it is tough. Oh, Whereas easy. training for a marathon there, like Dublin or New York, later on in the year, Sorry, you can train in the summer, yeah. which well, is nicer. Right. Mm. But uh, no, I do love London Marathon, so yeah. mm. it is the winter months. But diet wise, then mm. would you have to say, or have you any problem? Eat like a horse. Yeah. Just eat like a horse. Seven bars of chocolate a day, mm. averaging. Just under 10 stone weight. Oh, I went and got my bloods okay. done there uh, a couple of weeks ago because Eleanor said to me, Liam, you're, you're in big trouble with this chocolate. And my cholesterol was three. Nice. So that was a nice surprise. Really? So, uh, it is the body you have, but it's not really what you're putting into it. Uh, like, you know, your body's able to cope with that. Like. I, well, I, I would eat healthy apart yeah. from chocolate. Yeah. I would eat all, you know, the veg and, and uh, the chicken and the pasta mm. and... You know, I would eat a good, healthy, dinner-wise lifestyle, yeah. but I have a unbelievable desire for chocolate. Yeah. I think it's the running; just yeah. uh, it seems to make me crave chocolate. You know. Yeah. Uh, so do please do not forget Eleanor. Well, back up. how could I forget Eleanor? Yes, yeah. She is Eleanor, the rock. Believe, did we mention who Eleanor was? We did. Aye, Peter Eleanor Lennon's Peter daughter. Lennon. Uh, no, Aye. Eleanor is my rock. I have to say, and. Uh, I just put it up there on Facebook. It was her birthday, not yesterday, the day before, and uh, I did write that on it. That I don't know how I would manage without her because uh, all I do is run. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to the marathon and the fundraising, Eleanor has her like yourself there, Jared. She has her book, mm -hmm. and she's every penny that is donated all put in a file. And when Eleanor left the Dole office in Strabane to look after Rachel. A few years later then, she was the secretary over here in Drum the Bay. Yeah. So she's good with books and, and paperwork and all, like her father, God rest him, <laughs> Peter. And uh, Eleanor does all that. And you see, when I go to the marathons, she has yeah. my clothes packed, my running gear packed, everything's sitting ready. Mm -hmm. And as I say, I have the easy work. All I do is go out and run. Well, it's good to have. She is, you. definitely. I don't know how I'd manage with her. Oh, what a good idea. I love my person, mm. And it's obvious between the two years of the relationship you'd have, I'm, I'm trying to be like that beer McDonald's. You listen to beer and a battery and mm. you'd be talking to Jason right. Carter or somebody like that. Mm. But no, it is, it, it, you can't do that on your own. No, oh, no without doubt. No, they get to have support. But uh, the, the generosity as well, Jared, sorry for interrupting you, but the generosity of the public too. Like last year, I raised the most I ever raised for, for my fundraising event which was £11,354 for last year's London Marathon. Mm -hmm. And this year I said, I'm not even going to think about getting anywhere near that. Yes. And sitting here tonight, I think I'm sitting at 12700 and something pounds. So, uh, I way past last year's highest. And uh, as I say, that has put me now up over the £120,000 mark of, of fundraising for cystic fibrosis. So, uh, very, very proud of that, I have to say. Yes. Um, you would, would you be getting much sponsorship or, or from the Castle Derrick or the wider area here? Would you? I, I would. Even local businesses peop and, uh, have been very good, but the public as well. Public, yeah. mm -hmm. As you know, I was out running there two or three days ago and went out in the morning for a run just up from here, spam out up, up to Castle Derrick, up the Kilclean Road, across over to the Kilita Road, back in past St Eugene's and up through the town. and. I was away for about uh, 50 minutes and I come back with £185 in my zip pocket. People stopping me to give me donations. Mm -hmm. So it's unbelievable the generosity of the people. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's just unbelievable. And then, as I say, I have a Virgin Money Giving page on the internet, right. which I, I promote that through a video and stuff on Facebook. And, and uh, like yesterday, I, I got a donation from a man. Uh, from Denver and Colorado in America mm -hmm. and then this morning as I was saying I, I woke up and I seen the email at a half six in the morning I got another donation and it was from Springfield in Oregon yes. USA a man from Brazil sponsored me a few weeks back and uh, somebody from Australia one from Belgium and that's all through through the internet Definitely. so as well as now the main the main money is locally it is, yeah. it is locally, yeah. but all over the world as well. But no, the local people are just I can't I can't I can't describe how generous they've been. Oh no, no, no. Well, you, you've been uh, 
genuine straightforward person, you see, you're not a flash hire, you're not, you know. <laughs> well, thanks for that. People yeah. would, have, no, but people would mm. see, they would know that that's such a good motion, there's Liam McHugh. Mm. They, they see you well, in the town, they mm. see you up and down that road. So. That's my life now. Uh-huh. It is my life. Yeah. I just dedicate, as I say, my life to, because I would call this drug, as I say, or it can be, it's nearly a cure. But yes. But they reckon in 10 years' time they'll even have another drug above that. So they reckon even in 10 years' time that people living with cystic fibrosis, they might be able to say that they could live a full life with, with the medication, right, yeah. mm-hmm. you know. But uh, that's why I feel sorry for some of the people that haven't got the chance mm-hmm. to have this drug and that have passed away and different stuff. And But for me, there's a wee girl there... Uh, a young girl, 22 or 23 years of age, and she's just had a child there born with cystic fibrosis. And she contacted me, you know, and uh, and I could just oh, I feel her pain. 1992? Uh, but 1992 was just coming back to me, and she asked me, you know, does it get any easier and all. And, and you know, I've met the wee girl now, and, and uh, we've I had a backpack in Asda mm-hmm. there about three or four weeks ago, and she came down with her family and helped in the backpack and we raised two thousand pound yeah. you know for that for just a few hours five hours or something yeah. in asda but she came down and helped and i gave her one of these cystic fibrosis t-shirts yes. and uh, for her and her sister and all and she left with the t-shirt on and felt so happy and you know well it's not as black a tunnel as when you well let's say now for somebody born with cystic fibrosis today they have such a great chance better, better chance than than 24 yeah. years ago you know, I would say somebody born today, they should live a full, normal life, without a doubt. Mm-hmm. But people born 24 years ago, a lot of them haven't, haven't reached Rachel's age. They've died. You know, so we have been lucky, and I suppose maybe it's the fact that when, from the day Rachel was born, we've never missed a physio, never missed medication. We've just done everything that we've been told to do. And, and I think whenever you do the likes of that, it gives your child a better chance in life. You know. William, you've been preparing now for the, the London Marathon now, the 2016 London Marathon. You mm-hmm. were saying there, roughly, your, the serious change started there in January yep. 2016. Mm-hmm. And uh, what, per day, like what, what you say you do one day off a week, but what would the many miles are you putting up per day? Well, it, it sort of builds up, you know, from January, and, and you're supposed to build it up, you know, Jared, every week. Yeah. But... Uh, you could start off maybe you know week one you could be running something like maybe 25 to 30 miles a week and then uh, uh, they do tell you around 10 percent extra every week but it can it can go up to depending on how you feel but i've seen me running 80 to 100 miles in a week you know and probably shouldn't be that much but you know for me running has got so addictive it's just uh, Eleanor would say to me, even uh, over the years when I've been injured and not fit to run, she said, I'm like a bear with a sore head because I can't get out running. Oh, yeah. So it is addictive, you know, but uh, it, it is, it takes up a lot of time, you know, six days a week running. But uh, as I say, I've seen me on a regular basis running 80 to 100 miles in a week, regular. What's that? Not enough, you're going to get injured. Injuries. Yeah. Strange. Mm. Well, I would say this... Out of all my marathons, this has been my worst year yet for injuries. Right. Uh, the injury started uh, at the start of the marathon training, just before the marathon training. I, I took what what I can only call like a form of, uh, they say it's called in a runner's version, it's piriformis syndrome. But uh, in, in layman's terms, I would call it sciatica. Mm-hmm. So it feels, it seems like a trapped nerve just running down from the left side of my backside, right down the back behind the knee and down the back of the leg so it's just like a it's like a throbbing toothache and i have that there since the end of january right and it's been it's been just there niggling at me and then with me running with that there and even sometimes taking painkillers to run because of it uh, my knee then went because i think i was overcompensating you know for this injury so the knee went Mm -hmm. and uh I've taped there, look, on the back of my neck too. My neck, a baller turning round and I've two sore heels. So I'm crocked this year. So I'll not be going out to break no records at the London Marathon. But uh, I suppose there's a lot of uh, good people about as well in that sense about injuries because, uh, well, 
I'm a regular attender of a keep fit exercise, I would say this last 10 years, it's called Body Fit. Yes. It's a fellow Mervyn Camley from OMA, who's a, a very good friend of mine, and uh, Elner goes to it as well along with me. So that's more of a social thing as well as exercise, you know. Mm -hmm. But Mervyn's been a great man as well, you know, for rubs and massages and, and helping me out, you know, with minor injuries and stuff like that. But Where would Mervyn work from or run? Mervyn works from, uh, he would come... He does a body fit class in St. Pat's Hall in Castle Derg on a Thursday night. Right. And then he does one in Newton Stewart on a Tuesday night, which I, we go to as well. Mm -hmm. And he does one in Oma on a Monday night as well. So he's, he's three nights a week at least at that. And then, uh, mm -hmm. uh, as I say, he would do you know, uh, massages and, and rubs and stuff like that. But this one here, he, he's been working at me a lot too. And we just can't get shook of it. And to be honest, uh, a few weeks ago there, I had decided I was going to, withdraw from the marathon and uh mm -hmm. because of this injury and uh i remember i was down we were doing we talked earlier about the asda bagpack in straban mm -hmm. and uh just by chance at the asda bagpack uh brian McHugh, basie as he's basie, known yeah. as mm -hmm. uh basie came along and threw a few pound into the bucket and him and the wife brona and and uh i was sitting sort of sideways because of the pain here and yeah and he said to me, you're in bad looking shape there. And I said, aye, Brian, I'm not good. And I told him about, well, he knew about my marathon running oh, anyway, sure. but I told good. him about the injury. And, and Brian said to me, you know, why don't you give me a shout on Tuesday night? I'm sure we'll have a look at you to see. Mm -hmm. So uh, I said to him, I was pulling out of the marathon. And uh, I've been going to Brian now two nights or two days a week, anyway, this past six weeks or so. And uh, thank God I'm... I'm I'm fit now to be able to do the marathon. As Brian said, he, he, he's worked at me to get me around the marathon this year yes, because uh, of this. It's like a trapped nerve, as I say. Mm. Uh, it's went from not being able to run at all. Up until up until three weeks ago, Like uh, I was just only able to do steady nine-mile runs most days. Yes. And normally you build yourself up to 20-odd miles. So I wasn't able to do that this yeah. year. But up until a fortnight ago there, then I'd done two... 20 plus miles through the help of Brian and uh, as I say I'm still in a bit of pain but I know we'll get through the marathon this year and, and as I say having my biggest total now of, of uh, £12,700 at the minute and I always said no goals and uh, uh, I'm hoping now I might reach the lucky for some 13 grand maybe this year as well no it's always a every year you oh, don't yeah. ex you don't expect it no. but Good but that's it so I'm thankful to Mervyn and Bodyfit and I'm thankful to to uh, Brian Basie as well for they've been a great help to me and and you know uh, uh, our local doctor too you know Dr O'Hare Brenton O'Hare has been a good help to me too you know uh, and he's ran marathons so I've, I've went to him with ballers as well and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know he's always been been supportive to me as well. Would this be the worst year for injuries? Worst year uh, for st I would always I had you know, marathon running, uh, you always pick up injuries in marathon run, running because of the excess mileage. But this is the first time I would say that I've had injuries that hasn't went away. And uh, I'll tell you a wee quick story. The, uh, the injury I had when I'd done the New York marathon. And uh, I was sitting here in the living room at midnight and I was getting the backyard concreted by uh, across the road. Marty Quinn's boys across the road was concreting my backyard, you know, and... And I had a couple of holes done, you know, and one was for like a manhole for washing the cars. Yeah, sure. And uh, I remember I went to put the dog out to bed, out to the garage. And uh, I forgot that the manhole was round the back and the place was all muck and clay. And I walked out at about 12 o'clock at night and I fell down the manhole. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't get up and the dog was sitting squealing and licking at my face. And that was three weeks to the very day to the New York Marathon. And I remember I crawled to the back door and I banged the back door and shouted help. Hmm. And Rachel was sitting in here and Elner just went to her bed. But cut a long story short, my brother John across the road, they rang for him and he came over. And, and then I rang, or we rang my niece, Olivia Ramsey, who's uh, my sister Mary's daughter, Jarlath. She's a doctor. So uh, I was took away that night at one o'clock in the morning, uh, flashing blue lights with uh, an ambulance to Elton Galvin. And they thought I'd broken my hip and I had to get seven stitches or something in here in my hip. And uh, I was kept that night in Dalton Galvin Hospital and they told me, you'll not be doing no New York Marathon. Hmm. So uh, I got out the next day and 
I always remember that night too, the, the staff nurse, I think, and her sister, whatever staff nurse, maybe it was Brona McHugh, Basie's oh, wife at the time. And that's a coincidence now, just, you know, but uh, as I say, uh, they found out that it wasn't broke, but I left hospital that next morning in crutches. Mm. And it was three weeks to the New York Marathon. And I had, at that time, I had nearly, I think, at £5,915 raised. Mm. And that was 2011. And I said, how can I pull out of the New York Marathon? Flights and all booked. So I'd done no running for that last three weeks. Mm-hmm. Not, I never, I never went That's out of the door. I sat and I was in crutches for about four days. And then I, I was able to get up and walk about a wee bit. And, uh, I remember... Dr. Hare gave me strong painkillers to take on the day of the marathon and, and they seemed to have worked because I, I went out I went out that day then and ran three hours and 23 minutes. Nice. And not bad for a man that hadn't, no, 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 no. hadn't ran and fell down a manhole three weeks beforehand. So that was a story like, uh, and it was a good story in the end up. Yes. So there you go. That, that was an injury, but as I say, short term one, but this, is, this time it's just long term injury. Run Running gear, you're a flashy pair of thinners, aren't you? But uh, well, I like I like Asics. Yeah. Asics. I've been wearing them for a long time now, mm-hmm. and uh, I just I just they feel comfortable for me. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I do like as well. Some people don't like flashy colours, but mm. I might be coming fifty five years of age, but I'm still a young boy at heart. Oh, I, you always have a high. I love high bright. I really love the brighter the the, the trainers, the better for me. And even the best of times. Oh, yeah, you know, everything's bright. Right, yeah. And uh, you know, some people might say, "Oh, look at the age of that boy there," oh, but I still about. feel him a young a young oh, boy at heart. Yeah. <laughs> sure, oh, there's no harm in feeling it, anyway. No harm, not at all. Mm. But back there, just thinking now, when you're talking there, you said that like your people, your father was originally a, well, not your father, but has a, has relations was mm. originally from Cardiff, but. And then your father would have went to the football or taken John and got a yarn and that there and you were just yep. you were going over a wee bit there but mm. you remember like you were, you were a lot younger but you still was. stood up on a Sunday with them. That's right. Well, you, saying, you, you, you ran across Father Andy Dolan or you were sure. I did indeed. Well, my memory of, of a young fella was say, John McHugh, the bicycle man. Yeah. He had got this mini bus uh-huh. and there was never one like it about before and John used to get all us young boys, the likes of Bingo, his son, and Bingo McHugh and me, and Marty Lafferty, and Terence Geller, and Tar Lynch, and that squad. And we were only young fellas, maybe seven or eight years of age or whatever. And, and off we went. And Castle Deer got, at that time had no had no team. And my brother John mm-hmm. would have played, you know, for Ahi Iron Miners and stuff like that. And my, my, our Joe, my brother Joe as well. And, okay. and probably all Mc, John McHugh's ones, you know, maybe... I suppose in them days maybe Andy and Lexi and all them oh, ones and mm-hmm. but we used to go up to Ahi Arn to the matches and, and uh, I always remember too my father shouting across the field John John or John had a very short temper in the football yeah. field great wee dogged footballer as he was a great runner and, and before I go any further too as I say John's best time for a marathon was two hours and 38 minutes nice. you don't get that about here you know there's nobody Pat would be able to tell you himself there uh, I think well, I would fantastic. say he was the best, the best oh, yeah. marathon runner that has ever come out of this town. Yeah. Two hours and thirty-eight minutes. That's the same as me and you, Jared, running from here to Drum the Base School across the road as fast as we could sprint, but doing it for twenty-six miles. Mm-hmm. You know, you know uh, that was international class. Oh, yeah. But getting back to John, I always remember my father. Every time he went to a match, Daddy was always shouting, "John, John, John!" Was down banging. Oh punching and fighting he was a wild man and he was so quiet and that's civil that's but once he got onto the football field he, he, he just he was so determined you know father like his running like father andy i always remember that there too i remember us going to a match too and uh, uh i was only a young fella and i remember some of the boys on the sideline saying do you see that boy over there that boy's a priest and i says uh, are you sure and they says oh that man's a priest and i says no way because uh, I didn't know who this fella Andy Dolan was at the time, but I always remember. Turns out he's uh, friends yeah. of my wife Elner, right. cousins of Elner's now. But uh, uh, I didn't believe it, but I always remember, Jared, as well then, uh, the boys coming out of the changing rooms, the footballers at the end, and there was this man coming out with a dog collar on him, the, yeah. the priest collar on him, and there it was fella Andy Dolan. I believed it then. 
so but that was the law or the jungle at that time you know but I suppose he's only human Aye. No better man outside of a football team than Francis. Aye. Oh, a great man too, aye. Without doubt. You would have had a good relationship with, with most of the clergy in Drumna Bay, would you? Oh, definitely. And uh, see, we talked earlier about Father Moan. And uh, I ended up playing golf in my days before I started the running. And uh, I used to play every Wednesday with Father Moan. Yeah. I got got friendly with him, you know. And I there was me and God rest we, John O'Donnell. If you remember John oh, O'Donnell, married to Sally, yeah. me and John O'Donnell and Father Moan and Alan Coulter, we played every Wednesday, and there was always a couple of pound on it, uh, you know. And mm. uh, I remember it always. Then went down the last hole, and Father Moan, he, uh, he liked a wee flutter on right. the old horses and the golf and different stuff. He would bet, and and if he was losing, it was always me and Alan Coulter against Father Moan and and uh, John O'Donnell. And yeah. most times, Alan was a fairly handy golfer, and I was the young beginner. And, would have chipped in with an odd good hole there. Normally, John and Father Mullen was always losing, you know, going down the last hole, and he would always have said, you know, double or quits in the last hole. Yeah. He was a, he was always wanted to try and get his money back, you know. So, yeah. Aye, but no, Father Father Mullen ended up a very good family friend, and even his mother was his housekeeper, and Elner's mother, Sadie, mm -hmm. and Father Mullen's mother was great friends right. and they even went away to Bundoran for weekends and they loved the slot machines and all so he did become a very close family friend. The, the accused, was your father a sports person? For your family was sports or uh, the fellas were now? The boys, us boys were all very sporty but no, daddy wasn't really into sports. Daddy worked down and uh, my early recollection of daddy was he worked down in McCairn's garage at the bottom of the town Right. and uh, Believe it or not, I was called Liam, and I was called Liam after Father Liam McCairn, oh. Sean and Des McCairn's oh, brother, um, because Daddy worked for John McCairn, mm -hmm. and there was Mrs McCairn, I remember her and all too, but Daddy worked down there, and in his early days, he, he would have been fixing punctures and worked at motorbikes and stuff, and then mm -hmm. he taxied for McCairn's down there as well, yeah. but he was never really into sport much in his, in his time now, but... Uh, uh, because your brother, Joe... Uh, been a better soccer player nah, than what a footballer! I oh. have to say now, uh, I would say the if, abuse that he would get in it. Uh, they throw all the sizes in the middle of the field. And he was handy. He was and he, a good Gaelic footballer too. Oh, excellent! He could have stuck the ball over the net from from any he angle. Was 20, 30 years too early. Uh, over the bar, I mean, sorry, in Gaelic. Oh. But uh, I remember even boys saying to me, you know, that if if your brother Joe was about now with the opportunities oh. that young boys have nowadays. That he would have made it. You didn't have them opportunities in the, oh, way back in no, that no, no, no. in that time. Survival of the fittest. Aye, like that's it. For Barbie, and I remember, like for Aye. That's right. And this, this man was in the middle of the field dancing about. That's right. Well, well and I played with him as well for Barfield in our yeah. days because Aye. we went on and and won you know won the league with Barfield. Seamus Coyle was the manager Aye, and right. after Big Eamon Coyle and. Like we won the league and we had a really good team in them days too and, and uh, I remember our Joe, he could have knocked on 30 goals a season oh, right. and this was at the end of his career in his mid-30s, right. you know, was so he was, uh, he was very handy yeah, now, whereas John was more, John was more hard, uh, very hard, he could for all the size of uh, wee John, that's what he's called, wee John, uh, wee John but uh, no softy, no softy. Down in Spamming would have an advantage that like a, there would be no sort of sectarian thing involved in fundraising like you're lucky from that point of view like oh. all sides would be supporting your oh, deal right. as, as you would do to, uh, the other side if, or any side if we had any function you know uh -huh. would you feel that down here in Spam? would you get support like across With, the, without doubt yeah. without doubt like and uh, that's the never good thing never was an issue in Spam and, and that's the good thing about living in this oh, yeah. small yeah. environment this village it was always like we're we'll be married now 29 years this month mm. and as i say we bought the house of paddy devaney about three or four months before we got married so we're living down here as i say 29 years and uh it's just it's just been great and it's it's been it's been mixed and it's just been it didn't matter it didn't, it didn't matter. matter and that was the lovely thing about it, it. Through, the troubles as well. through the troubles as well mm. and you no know, there were some bad times as well about here, about this area, but at the same time, everybody stuck together and uh, through fundraising and all that there, I've had young ones as well 
young girls in that park there that joined our Cystic Fibrosis Committee, mm. uh, both religions, and, and uh, they went out and helped me with door-to-door -door collections and stuff, and, mm -hmm. and it was a good thing. They all mixed and all played together, and uh, it's, just, it's just been the best way to grow up. And now, the way things is going now, people have moved on so much as well, yeah. and it's for the better. Times take care of an awful lot of uh, sort of uh, stupidity. Uh, you know, time. Definitely. E even the politicians, like, I mean, mm. you, have, you have no problem with the approaching a politician irrespective of his political party. That's you know? right. Oh, you know, without doubt. You define that, aren't we? Well, uh, even, you know, to do with cystic fibrosis and that, or can be drug, yeah. you know, I have, I have approached different politicians with different religions. Oh. And... Uh, all of them have uh, took on board what I had to say about the Orkambi and said that they will do their utmost to help us to get this drug funded and especially for Rachel to get to get this drug on a permanent basis and no bother. Looking forward, Liam, I mean, uh, we don't have to look too far forward, but I mean, looking forward say in the next five to ten years, what, how do you hope cystic fibrosis, how do you hope you'll be actively in, mm. in, in the promotion of it well let's put it this way uh, Elner has told me because of the injuries I've had this mm -hmm. year for the London Marathon she's told me that uh, after the London Marathon she's getting all my running gear and she's throwing them into a bag and sticking them up in the attic out of the way yes, indeed. That, uh, and Dr <laughs> O'Hare has told me he says you should take a, a year out that my body's got such a battering over the years but yeah. I'll probably take a couple of months rest, Jared, mm -hmm. away from it, a uh, complete break away from for the first time ever. I've seen me at the London Marathon uh, going out for a run the next day, and maybe the day after that, and maybe doing a 10k race a weekend after the, mm -hmm. the London Marathon, you know, so that's not going to happen this time. This, this sciatica nerves has to heal, so I'll take a wee break for a couple of months, but... I'll still keep fundraising if it's not. But you're still you're still a figure ahead for you. I mean, the fun even you weren't running the fundraising, I'll still continue. Like, you know. oh, there's other things, you know. There's there's things like backpacks and ASDA. There's uh, you know, some of I've, I've had a couple of good friends as well. There's a fellow there, Andy Scanlon from uh, oh, well, yeah, Order. Right. Andy, I would have met him through running. I would do a bit of running as well for the Fun Valley, you know, mm -hmm. over the years and. Uh, Andy had a stars in the rise there, remember, sure. and you were involved yeah, in that as well. Fun Valley, yeah. So Andy and uh, there's a few of the girls involved in that there, Theresa O'Donnell, That's right. and they've decided now they want to have a shave arms and legs and chest of the men. So they're talking about doing that within the next two or three weeks. And, uh, there's a fellow Ian Sproul from Drumquan, and he's offered, he's doing a fishing competition for me for cystic fibrosis. So there's always different ways to make money. And uh, it'll... I'm not going to stop fundraising. Should I have to stop running for a, a short period, maybe, but the fundraising will keep going on. Right. Yeah. We know there, Patrick, given the... You have mm. a holiday home in Rosnada. I have a caravan, a, a uh, mobile home. Mobile home yeah. Uh, Would you use it much? I do. Well, I'll tell you how that come about as well. 24 years ago, when Rachel was born, I always remember uh, Dr. Redmond and Pat. You would remember Dr. Redmond. That was the nineteen ninety three marathon. We all we got Dr. Redmond down to Noel Devine's pub in Newton for the for the prize given. Right. And uh, she told us that the best thing that you could do for your daughter would be to have an environment of good, healthy sea air. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't long after that that we got uh, looking about. A caravan in Ross Nila. Mm -hmm. So that was 24 years ago, and uh, we're still there yet. Mm -hmm. And I would do an awful lot of running up the beach from. The I'd normally get the caravan turned on there around St. Patrick's Day yeah. and get up and uh, get up the beach, spend a lot of time in Ross Nila. And Rachel has spent a lot of her years in yeah. Ross Nila, and mm -hmm. I think the sea air has been good for her. Well, you know, huh? So it's good for the chest, you know. But we love Ross Nila, it's just. It's just like a second home and the friary up there too is just so peaceful and getting up there and we've got friendly with a wee man up there as well father pascal right and uh he took rachel under his wing i remember taking him to uh rachel as a baby oh, yes. uh, and uh we'd still be in regular contact with him now you know and uh it's great to have somebody like that somebody you know 
spiritual up there as well to visit and, and as I say we even text each other and, and very friendly a good friend and he's been a lot of good help you know to us over the years yes. you need to get away from the, the sort of the work environment too, oh it's great as well as, you know. it's just like recharging the batteries getting up there it's, yeah. and it's 45 minutes from here but you just feel as if you're in another world oh, you know and you're just a couple of hundred yards away from the beach and away with the dog at night for a walk in the dark and, and, and the beach, you know, down along the lights of the Sandhouse Hotel and, and up in the morning, first thing and away for... That beach, you know, people often ask me this as well and people don't understand, they don't believe it, but, you know, with, when you're running, you have one of these Garmin watches that tells you how far you've gone and how much calories you've lost and all that, but I remember, you know, one day thinking to myself, I'm going to go up that beach as far as I can go. Yeah. So I went down to the very bottom of the beach at the rocks, which brings you up to the friary. So I remember starting my watch down there at the bottom there, just below the Smuggler's Creek, mm -hmm. you know, the, the pub up above. And I went up there as far as I could go. Mm -hmm. And you go on up round the corner, right, yeah. and then you go through a, a wee beach called the Manor. Right. It's called the Manor Park. Yeah. It's a, like a private bit. And you go on through there, and then you come to Murva. Oh, so that yeah. beach just, it's all it's continuous. Continuous. And you go on past Murva Beach and you can see Murva Golf Course on your right. And then you go on by Mur Murva Beach and you go on up around the corner there and you see the Salmon Inn. Mm -hmm. And then you go on up just past there until you can go no further. And then it's not a being in sight. I remember being up there one day on a good summer's day and all I seen was uh, about 12 seals lying in the sun and them sunbathing. Mm -hmm. And when I got up towards them, they all dashed into the, into the sea. Out of the, and I was glad because I was going to turn. I thought maybe God, I seen these two big like oh, teeth hanging out, you know. But but no, they left and went in. But I remember then, been up and down there several times, and I met a man up there one day, and I could see a place just across. I remember thinking that doesn't look too far away. You can nearly swim across. Probably was a fair distance, you know. Ah. But I, there was a man up there one day, and I don't know who it was. And I said to him, "Excuse me, what's that over there?" And he says. That's Mount Charles. So that's how far you, that's how far you can go up that beach that you you can look across at Mount Charles. But I remember looking and my, my watch was uh, eight point two five miles, and then you had to go back the same again. So you're talking nearly sixteen and a half miles, all sand, and that you could go no further. I went as far as you could go, and up there at the very top of the beach, there's parts of it, just you can't run on it. It's about a foot deep. You're just walking, you know, but it's, it's but nice. Remember Michael Dwyer who trained the great carry team of aye. the 70s? Right. He, he had picked belief in the sand. Oh, aye. And it does give your joints a bit of a, a, a wee bit of a, a break as well, the aye. softer sand. But that main beach of Ross Nile is quite hard. Hard, aye, I don't know. It is hard, but once. Aye, the cars is on. But see, once you get on up around the corner, but you know, it does soften. Mm. Certain parts are soft and certain parts gets hard again, but. It's, it's a good workout now. It I suppose the bike marathon when you're taking part in any of the local runs? Like. Oh, I have indeed. The likes of... I would have done several... Say, bigger ones would have been several dairy half marathons. I've done a good few of them and several Oma half marathons. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I've done quite a few 10Ks and quite a few uh, 5Ks. Yeah. And then when I got involved with the Fun Valley Club there too, I would have done... The Donegal Grand Prix series there. I've done it there a couple of years back, mm -hmm. uh, which was maybe doing one or two five k's every week, yeah. and that was good because it, it sort of it improved your fitness mm -hmm. and brought brought your times down. And and I suppose for a man over fifty years of age to be able to do five k's in nineteen minutes, you know, it was all right. And that was in my fifties. I done my fastest five k's ever through doing them on a weekly basis. And yeah. It was nice too getting prizes first and second in, in your category, you know, and a few euros into it as well. So, and then you have Gemma's run, Gemma, Gemma McGill, which is now coming up on Friday, the 13th of May. Uh -huh. uh, Gemma McGill was best friends with my daughter, Rachel. Oh, is that right? Uh, and, uh, you know, that was sad, and Rachel Very was sad. totally heartbroken and, and about that. And uh -huh. even when Gemma died, we still had her hot water bottle and. and, and me things up in our caravan where she stayed and and it was very very sad that you well, know. Oh yeah. so you have Kieran is like yourself it was an awful effort onto the fundraising for Gemma's run like uh, 
He does. I suppose it's the only thing that he says keeps him going. You know, it's very sad. Very, very sad. Like, Poor Gemma. Gemma's gone. Like, mm. Rachel's with you. Rachel's here. Yeah. That, thank God she is. And, That's right. You know, I suppose, <coughs> looking back, you know, years ago, you would have thought it could have been the other way around. You know, and uh, it's ser- ter- terrible sad about, about Gemma, yeah. but it's still great that, that, as I say, Rachel's still with us. That's right. You know, that's yeah. the way things have moved on in cystic fibrosis. Did you want to race in Derry on a beach? Uh, uh, that was Christmas. Right. That was just around Christmas time there. There lately, just before I got injured. 2015? Uh, uh, Christmas 2015, just there. Mm-hmm. three of, what This is now April, so it's just around four, just over four months ago. Uh, there was a 5K. Uh, it was called uh, a Santa Port Stewart, it was. Port Stewart Beach. So uh, there was about, there was probably up on maybe 98 or 96 people at it. And uh, it was one of the worst days that you ever wound in rain. And uh, it was flooded, the uh, floods even on the road down to, to Port Stewart. But uh, I arrived, I remember I arrived at the run and uh, normally you go out and you, you warm up for, for uh, 15, 20 minutes, a good oh, hard yeah. run. And I arrived because of the floods on the road, and the race was to start one o'clock, and I arrived at two minutes to one. Oh, no. And the uh, good thing about it is I had my shorts and all on me. So I just jumped out, no warming up. No. And, uh, you know, that's the funny thing about it is uh, I went out and ran, and I'd done that, and uh, roughly, I think it was around 19 minutes and, and 48 seconds, something like that there. And, and the 5K and, and the wind and the rain. The one was on the face hitting you on the way on the way up the beach, but you had to turn then at a mile and a half or so and back down, and you were nearly freewheeling on the way back, you know. So it was tough on the way up, but good on the way back. But I, I won that race, and uh, it was nice, nice to win a five k, you know. First time ever to won a five k race. All right. Uh, Would you take a part in the Greencastle one at all? I do. Uh, boxing day, I I do that every year. I'd say I've done that for this last 10, 11 years, mm. never miss it, with my old partner, Pat O'Loughlin. Pat, I would pick Pat up and the two of us go every year and do it together. And uh, Pat always comes up with a prize every year for mm. for first prize in this category. So it's a tough run. Uh, it's one of the toughest runs you could ever do. It's a five mile road run, but uh, between uh, three and a half, th- maybe three miles to four miles, mm. Uh, there's a hill and it makes Paula's run up here in Castle Dear, that hill that Paula's run yeah. it makes it look like nearly downhill go. it's that steep and it's a tough, tough, tough run but it's it's great in Boxing Day to get the old turkey oh, out of your system, system and all mm. 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 Oliver, very enjoyable Paula, Oliver, great man, yeah. good friends and he's good friends of me and Pat yeah. and uh, he puts a lot of effort I think that run's going for I don't know, Pat, would have, I would say 25, 30 what years maybe, that? you know, and it's, he gets massive crowds, you know, well over a thousand runners every year on exactly. Boxing Day, uh, and some years he has a few celebrities and stuff, you know, mm. like, uh, there was Nadine Coyle, and she had a boyfriend at that time, some boy, or some American, I can't yeah. remember, Jesse, somebody, and then you had uh, the wee girl from Gorchin, Janet, Devlin, oh, that's right. she was in the X Factor. Mm. I remember one year Pat and me as well got uh, we we met John Daly, oh, right. John Daly, the UTV presenter. You know, and there was there was then a fellow out of Shameless that Channel Four show. Yeah. He he uh, was there, you know, to start to shoot the gun at the start of the race. You know, and so Oliver he puts a lot of work in. And one of the years he he picks a chosen charity every year, and, and one of the years he picked cystic fibrosis as well. You know, so. That's why I would have su- oh, yeah, try and support it every year now. So that's all good. Oh, it's good fun. Mm. Or Liam, I think we maybe have covered most of your life uh, up to now. Anyway, and quite a bit. Now. That there's a good bit more to go. Let's and hope so, Jared. Let's hope so. Hopefully, to, mm. for part two. Oh, it's uh, been very enjoyable. Uh, oh, no, um, you're easy to listen to because you have a good story to tell. And, well, uh, as I say, we'll, we'll um, have a look at see how. Out. Right. And we'll be back again, hopefully after the London Marathon. See how things are. That's great, and thank you to you and Pat for coming uh, down and having this wee chat with me. It's been thoroughly enjoyable. And is there anything else, Pat? You think we might have? 
need to cover now? Don't think so, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Always remember Green Castle, eight man with Green Castle. You get very well fed afterwards. You do indeed, bread. Pat. The oh, homemade well, bread. What's all the great spread? That's right. Bread. Without doubt, the 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 hot punch as well, and the. Mm -hmm and the the buns and the cakes and the whole meat bread and there's soup some years as well and, and it's, it's you'll be we'll ready not, for it we'll not forget the center nahi iron and nahi we'll iron center you'll not get a better spread than that anywhere mm -hmm. last year and even too you had even hot food at ahi iron so mark conley too puts up puts up a lot of effort and work yeah. into all that there so you know credit goes to that man as well you know he he, he puts on oh, a lot I, of work I into mean, his training it's a bit like you in the city of the apart from multiple stores if you hadn't of Kieran McHale for Gemma's run, it mm. wouldn't that be the same? Aye. Because the effort he puts in. That's right. I know it's a mission for him, but at the end, mm. you've got to reward a man because the amount of effort he puts Aye. in. That, like, That's he right. He does get a lot of support then. That's he does. Really help, you That's right, and but it's good to see you it. You know yourself, if somebody's genuine, people will, it doesn't matter what it's for, they give them support. That's right. They'll see, Without they'll doubt. see through a con man break like Aye. No, people, get away one year, but, uh, but people are very genuine about oh, here, are. very yeah. great supportive of, 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 of yeah. good causes, oh, yeah. you know, so it's great. Thank you very much, Liam. No bother, and thank uh -huh. you.